This morning our scripture reading will be coming from the book of Mark, chapter 3, verses 13 through 19. Mark 3, verses 13 through 19. Jesus' appointment of his twelve apostles. And he went up on the mountain and called to him those he himself wanted. And they came to him. Then he appointed twelve that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have power to heal sickness and to cast out demons. Simon, whom he gave him the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he came to name the sons of thunder, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon, the Canaanite, and Jesus, the chariot, who, who also betrayed him, and they went into a house. Bruce called last night, and he says, he said, what translation are, do you want me to read from? And I said, well, whatever is comfortable for you, but I usually put the New King James up there for the scripture reading. And then uh, most of the rest of the scriptures will come from the English Standard Version because it's the way I normally do it. Uh, but uh, I appreciate that. Uh, also, uh, Alan appreciates I didn't give him the names to read, even though those are more common than a lot of other names. When, uh, when God came down to live with us in the flesh, when he came down to be with us, when he came down to experience life as we do, he made some really important decisions along the way. And one of the most far-reaching things he did during the time that Jesus was on earth was he appointed 12 men to carry on his ministry. If it had only been his ministry for three and a half years and we never heard anything else about him, we probably wouldn't be here this morning. But the 12 men he chose carried his words. They carried his teachings. They carried his love. They carried his commitment to the whole world. And because they carried the news to the whole world and because they wrote down what they saw and heard and because they remembered the things that he had taught them and shared those things with others, we are here, in fact, today following Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who did, in fact, come down to earth to be with us and chose these 12 to be his apostles. That's one of the terms that we use there. The, the Greek word is apostelos, which comes from the Greek word apostello, which is a verb. The verb means to, to send or to go. And, and so an apostle or apostelos is the one who is sent, the one who goes, the one who goes out, a messenger. Oftentimes in, in ancient Greek manuscripts, this word is used in terms of ambassadors. And maybe had the English translations been made directly from Greek rather than from Latin, and maybe had not there been 1,400 years of people referring to the apostles of Jesus and, and with all capital letters, maybe that's the way our Bibles would translate them today as ambassador because that's probably a better translation of the word in our modern English language. But because apostle became apostle, now we have ambassadors who are just ambassadors, but apostles are those that follow Jesus. And, and, and so that's the really the only distinction there if we look at that. These 12 are chosen to be special envoys for Jesus. Can you imagine today, uh, I don't know why I'm not, there it is, but can you imagine a modern day chief of staff or HR person trying to write a job description so that we could hire apostles? You know, well, you need to be fluent in, Aramaic and Hebrew and Greek and in Latin and any additional language would be really helpful. And, uh, and, and not only that, you need to be able to recite entire events that you witness word for word, voice for voice, speech for speech, action for action, and you need to get it all right 20 years from now. That would be pretty tough probably. And maybe we might even go so far as to say, the minimum educational requirements include a Master of Divinity from an approved Brotherhood College. I don't know why that's always in the job description of things. but uh, And then uh, a minimum of five years experience in full-time ministry. That would be probably what an HR person might write. But that wasn't the job description Jesus gave them. What they might leave out 
in their job description is must be willing to travel extensively, often into dangerous areas where you will be hated with no foreknowledge of where you're going or when you're coming back. Maybe they would leave out, must be willing to forego sleep, food, and shelter as necessary. Maybe they might leave out, must be willing to be ridiculed, humiliated, ostracized, and eventually murdered for your faith. <clears throat> if they had put those in the job description up front, a lot of people probably wouldn't have applied for them, right? They didn't really know for sure what was going on. Jesus, come up, Jesus came up to them and says, hey, follow me. He needed help to complete his ministry. He knew that and he chose them. By the way, Jesus is still hiring. If you want to be called to go out and to share Jesus' message, he's still hiring. He hasn't quit. He's still available and the pay is pretty much still the same. Must be willing to suffer all of those things that you have to suffer for the cause of Christ because the reward is out of this world. It is absolutely outstanding. We read Mark's account already. Luke says it something like this. He says, in these days, he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve whom he named apostles, Simon whom he named Peter, Andrew his brother, James and John, and Philip and Bartholomew, and Th Matthew and Thomas, and James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon who was called the Zealot, and Judas the son of James, and Judas Iscariot who became a traitor. Matthew records it like this. He says, And he called to him his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out to heal every disease and every affliction. The names of the twelve apostles are these. First Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother. James, the son of Zebedee, and John his brother. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew the tax collector. James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus. Simon the zealot and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Now, the others show the, the selection of the apostles after a night of prayer or after a time. Matthew says this and posts this right before Jesus sends them out. And so we're going to look at that a little bit today. We're going to look at some of that stuff. And, and the first thing we want to look at is, is some general ideas about their selection. Someone asked me one time, why were there 12 apostles? Well, actually, in our Bibles, you will find 17 people whom the scriptures refer to as apostles. You have the 12 that we already understand, and you also have Matthias, who comes in as a replacement. You have Paul and Barnabas. You have uh, James, the Lord's brother, in the book of James. You have Jesus himself, who is referred to as an apostle of God. So, so you have those seven. We're going to look at the 12 this morning. We're going to try not to be confusing as we look at the 12 that Jesus chose and what they did and, 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 and to understand a little bit about them. And why there were 12, maybe these passage from Luke and from Revelation, maybe they give us a clue there. He says that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Maybe he needed 12 so they could do that. Uh, maybe because uh, Revelation 21 refers again, it had a great high wall with 12 gates, at 12 gates, 12 angels, and on the gates the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. So maybe there's significance to the 12 because of the 12 tribes of Israel, and I think maybe there is some truth to that. Uh, I don't know that enough to say that that's absolutely what it is. I just know that there's a little bit of that. There were two sets of brothers. There were Peter and Andrew, and there were James and John. Uh, some might say a third set, and, and we'll get to that in a minute as we talk about them. Uh, but there was nothing special about them over other people. Simon Peter's always mentioned first, not because he is better than anyone else, but rather because maybe he had some leadership skills that some of the others hadn't shown. It's not that he was better, uh, you know, uh, in Acts chapter 10, Peter wouldn't allow Cornelius to bow down to him. He said, I'm just a man like you are, just like you are. In 1 Corinthians 9, Paul said he had the same rights and privileges as Peter and the other apostles. He could have a wife too, just like Peter did. And he, 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 he actually says it in a way that I, thought, I always thought was funny when I was a kid. He could carry a wife around with him if he wanted to. I always thought that was funny as a kid, carrying your wife. Uh, but uh, said he could do that. In Galatians 2, Paul says that he confronted Peter to his face because he was a hypocrite. 
He was one way with the Gentiles. He was another way when the Jews showed up. He wanted to be accepted by the Jews, and so he was willing to put aside the Gentiles and his love for them. He wasn't anything special. By the way, not only is Peter always mentioned first, Judas is always mentioned last. And it always says he was a betrayer. They don't forget to add that part in there. How would you like that to be your legacy in the world? The one who betrayed Jesus. That would be tough for us. None of them had any special ranking or, or abilities that we know of. Uh, you know, in Acts chapter 4, they said they were unlearned and uneducated men, and they were surprised at their audacity at speaking the way they were able to speak and their abilities to speak as they were for Jesus. You know, that's consistent with the teachings of 1 Corinthians. That's the teaching of the, consistent with the teachings of Romans. We are all part of one body. We are all Christians, one of another. We all belong to the one body. We're all part of the body. No one is higher than anyone else. Christ is the head. I'm not the head. The elders are not the head. The deacons are not the head. The Bible class teachers are not the head. And the cradle roll is not the head. No, Jesus is the head. We're all part of the body, and we're all members of this body, and we all are part of what it is. You know, the whole idea of one Christ follower thinking that others ought to kowtow to him and bow down to him is just foreign to Scripture. When I see this guy who has nearly a billion Christ followers following him, and they bow to him and kiss his ring, and they almost worship him, that makes me sick. It is in absolute opposition to scripture. It is absolutely horrifying to think that a man would think that highly of himself. <sighs> Rather, Jude writes, I'm a slave of Christ Jesus. Rather, Paul says, I've given up everything, and I count it all but loss. Rather, we are Christians, and Christians only. Amen? That's the way the Bible says it. Mark says that Jesus appointed 12, whom he named apostles, so that they might be with him, and he could send them out to preach. That's their primary goal, is to go out and preach. That's what, they're, that's what he appointed them for, and yes... They had to be students before they could preach. You can't talk about what you don't know. Well, you can, but people know that pretty quick. Maybe that's why so many struggle with evangelism. It's hard to share your faith when you haven't really solidified your faith in your own mind. That's why I love that series of lessons we had by David Riley and, and, and how it was able to reinforce for many of us the things that we had known all along and we've known for years. We just... We just kind of let it slip by the back a little bit to the back burner, and it was less of, of what we wanted to do. So let's next look briefly at the 12. This is actually from the church directory of the New Testament church. Uh, maybe not. Uh, I think it's a coloring sheet, and, uh, and I think it works pretty good. So let's look at the 12 and see what we can know about them. The first that's always maimed is Simon Peter. Uh, Peter means rock. He's also called Cephas. He's found in John, and in 1 Corinthians, he's listed there as Cephas. Uh, he was from Bethsaida. Later, he lived in Capernaum, and he was brought to the Lord by his brother Andrew, and, and at first, he was very impetuous, and at first, he was very wavering in character. And yes, that's a picture from The Chosen, and you'll notice several of these are from The Chosen just because... I kind of like that series a little bit. The next one that's listed is James. James is the older brother of John, and uh, his father was Zebedee, his mother was Salome, the mother or the sister of Mary, so he's a cousin of Jesus. And, and he was a fisherman, and, and probably a pretty productive fisherman. They had their own boats, and, and they were able to, to produce like that. Uh, he and his brother, they were known for strong tempers, hence the term Boanerges, sons of thunder. They were known for having strong tempers. There's a time that comes along later on where James and John are going to look at someone that's teaching, but they're not part of the group, and they're going to say, Lord, should we call down fire on them? 
boy, they were ready to go. That's who they were, and that's who he was as much as anything else. He became the first martyr in the church when he was beheaded, and we find that in the book of Acts. John was the disciple whom Jesus loved. I suppose that's supposed to be him on the Isle of Patmos. Many of the first pictures on the two pictures I have of each one are, are from the 15th century Renaissance period, and you'll notice that they all have an Italian look about them more than they do a Jewish look about them because that's where the painters were. And so uh, they look much more European than they do Jewish maybe. Uh, but John wrote the books that bear his name, John and, and then the three little Johns, and also Revelation. Uh, much of what was said about him and about James could be said about John. Uh, he's the only apostle that died a natural death. He was exiled to Patmos, and all the others were martyred. As we continue on, we see Andrew. Andrew was the Lord's first disciple. Out of all of them, in John 1, 35 through 40, Andrew's the first one to leave off and follow after Jesus. That's important. In the gospel accounts, he's always introducing people to Jesus. You read about Andrew, almost every time you see Andrew's name, other than just in the list of the apostles, it will be some men came and wanted to meet Jesus, and Andrew brought him to Jesus. Andrew goes and gets his brother and brings him to Jesus. Andrew brings people to Jesus. That's what he's known for. Wouldn't you like to be known for that? Nobody wants to be known as the one that betrayed Jesus, but wouldn't you like to be known as someone who brings people to Jesus? What a great legacy that is as we look at that. Philip is from Bethsaida. He's the one that introduced Nathaniel, also known as Bartholomew, to Christ. That's Philip that we learn about him there. And we go on, we see uh, Bartholomew. He's the son of Talmai. He's also known as Nathaniel. And Jesus says of him, Behold an Israelite in whom there is no guile. Here's somebody that's faithful. Here's somebody that's not just playing the game. Here's somebody that's living out what he believes. That's what Jesus says of this man. How would you like that to be your legacy? Jesus said, I was faithful. Jesus said, I was honest in my faith. That's what Jesus said of this man, and, and, and what a great legacy that is for him. The next is Thomas in Aramaic. He's also called Didymus in the Greek, and we see that in and. uh and some have said Didymus means twin, so maybe he had a twin brother. I don't know that. Maybe he looked like somebody else, or maybe Didymus was just a, a Greek translation of his name. I don't know enough about that to know the difference about that. What we do know about Thomas is that he was so dedicated to the Lord that in John chapter 11, when Jesus says, we're going back to Jerusalem, and they said, oh, wait, they're, they're going to kill you if you go back to Jerusalem. Jesus said, nevertheless, we've got to go. And John says, well, let's go with him so we can die with him. That's how dedicated he was. He was willing to die with Jesus. That's our Thomas. That's who Thomas was when we look at Thomas. We think of Thomas as the doubter sometimes. Isn't that the first thought that comes to your mind when you think of Thomas? Doubting Thomas? How about faithful Thomas that was willing to die with Jesus? He was just logical enough that it didn't make sense that somebody actually came back from the dead until he saw it with his own eyes. The next one is Matthew, also known as Levi. Um, he was a tax collector. Tax collectors weren't real popular. He once threw Jesus a feast, and, and a lot of tax collectors came to it. He wrote the first book of the New Testament, and, and, and that's Matthew. We, we read about him and we hear him. He's talking to, he's the first of all the writers of the New Testament to tell us about the things that Jesus did. Without his writing, we wouldn't have much of the New Testament. In fact, Luke says that he had researched the other writings and he had researched and interviewed the other people. So probably without Matthew's writings, we wouldn't have Luke's writings either. Just think how important this man was as he stood up for Jesus and spoke up for Jesus. The next is James, the son of Alphaeus, or James the Lesser, he's often called. Uh, Alphaeus is the same name as Clopas. Later on, we're going to see Clopas uh, listed among the followers of Jesus and the close followers of Jesus. He's referred to as James the Less in Mark 15, maybe because he was small in stature, or more likely because he was younger than the other James. You got James the Older and James the Lesser. 
That's probably why he was actually named that. It's not necessarily that he was smaller, although historically people have tried to make him smaller in stature in different ways. Uh, an interesting thing about James, the son of Alphaeus, is that Matthew's father is also listed as Alphaeus. Now, nowhere in Scripture does it say these two are brothers. And there could have been many men named Alphaeus at one time or another in that community. But it's also possible that James and Matthew are brothers. We don't know that. There's no way for you to know it. There's no way for me to know it. There's no way to know it's not true. So it's possible we have three sets of brothers among the apostles as we look at this. Although, again, they're never specifically called brothers and there could have been another Alphaeus, and we need to understand it. The next is Thaddeus, or Labaius, and uh, he's also called Judas, the son of James. Now, here's something that, just personal opinion. If my name was Thaddeus, Judas, and Judas betrayed Jesus, guess what I would want you to call me from now on? I would not ever remind anybody that Judas was a part of my name. I just wouldn't do it. And so Thaddeus, also known as the other Judas, this guy, it's possible, we don't know much about him, he's considered one of the very minor possibilities, like a, a little tiny percentage of people say maybe he wrote the book of Jude. Most people say absolutely not. Uh, the writer of the book of Jude says he's a slave of Christ and the brother of James. We have no indication that, that Thaddeus was anything other than, as an apostle, he would have been a follower or a slave of Christ. So maybe, maybe he could qualify there. But we don't know that for sure. We have no way of knowing that. I don't know it. You don't know it either. If somebody else tells you they know it for sure, they don't know it either. Uh, then we have Simon the Zealot. Uh, and the, the word zealot is a Greek conglomeration of the Aramaic Canaanian. And so in some of our translations, it'll say Simon the Canaanite instead of Simon the zealot. It just simply means he was from outside. But the zealots were a specific group within the Jews. There were four major groups of, among the Jews. And, and, and the zealots were those who wanted to make sure everything was done to restore Israel to their full prosperity in the time of King David. And so if you did anything that broke the laws of Moses, they were after you. If you did anything that allowed you to cooperate with the Roman government, they would be after you for that. So it doesn't, it's, it's like they were always angry at somebody. That's what they were really known for, is being angry at somebody all the time because nobody was living perfectly and they wanted everybody to live perfectly. Now folks, there's nothing wrong with wanting people to live perfectly. God wants us to live perfectly. That's what he wants. But God has mercy and they didn't show very much. And there's a difference there. There's a great difference there. I look out and I see a group of folks that want to live perfectly. And I realize that all of y'all, just like me, are just a little weak sometimes. And we fall just a little short of perfection sometimes. And that's okay. Because God knows us and he loves us. They were not quite as forgiving about that. By the way, how many of them do you think lived absolutely perfectly? Yeah, there you go, Alan. I think you nailed that right on the head. Not very many. In fact, not any. The next one is Judas Iscariot. I think it's great that when they paint him, they always paint him with his head to the side because he's sneaky and conniving. I'm not sure that's really the way he would have looked. He was the treasurer for the apostleship. He's dishonest in the use of the funds, and later he betrays the Lord, and I think he probably looked more like that. Just a normal guy. If he'd have looked like an evil guy in the first place, all of the others would have known in the, right off the bat, hey, he's evil. We picked him out because he's evil. You know, can you imagine if they'd have got Lex Luthor? Sorry, that's, that's too old for some of y'all, too young for some of y'all. Uh, can you imagine if they'd have got Freddy Krueger to play the part of, of Judas? We would expect that, right? When we saw him, we'd say, oh, that's a bad guy. I don't think people saw him as a bad guy. I think they saw him as one of the apostles. I think they saw him as somebody that could be trusted to handle the money bags. Now, wait a minute. 
you got a tax collector. He handles money all the time. Wouldn't he be better qualified to do that? Shouldn't you put an accountant in that role? But no, they put Judas in that role. And Judas betrayed him. So in Matthew 10, that's where we're going to spend most of our time. I'm not going to read it all. But in Matthew 10, we see Jesus commissioning the 12. One of the highlights of a new officer's career is on their commissioning day. They will always remember their commissioning day. And at the Naval Academy, one of the, one of the traditions is that the family will buy them a sword on the day that they are commissioned. That's part of the commissioning ceremony. And in fact, if, if your family can't afford to buy a sword for you, the Navy will actually finance a sword and take it out of your salary for the next four years. Uh, but the Navy will actually provide a sword for you at your own cost because that's part of the commissioning ceremony. By the way, just a hint for those who don't understand, when you're on an aircraft carrier and you're 2,000 miles from the nearest land and the planes are the ones that are flying over towards the other land, a sword is not very much use. <laughs> they don't carry it with them when they get out in the fleet. The sword stays home, uh, but it's part of the commissioning ceremony. And Jesus is going to commission his disciples. He's not just going to, he's not just going to uh, appoint them, he's going to send them out on a mission. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go out not into the way of the Gentiles, not into any city of the Samaritans, enter not, but go rather the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you've received, freely give. You know, can you imagine that? He sends them out two by two. Sending them out two by two accomplishes a couple of things. Number one, they'd have a companion with them while they travel. You know, sometimes it's hard when you're by yourself. And you know what else? Number two, it's easy to get discouraged when you're all by yourself. It's harder to be discouraged when you have somebody along with you that's sharing the burden and sharing the load with you. It's harder to be discouraged. I've done very much door knocking and campaigning through my life, and it's a whole lot easier when there's two than there is when there's one. By the way, you're much more likely to get somebody to visit with you when there's two rather than when there's only one. So he's getting ready to send them out and he tells them to preach about the kingdom, preach about repentance, to preach the gospel only to the lost sheep of Israel. Only to the lost sheep of Israel because Israel's the messianic nation. Israel's the ones that are looking forward to the kingdom. Now they're not going to be stuck with that restriction for long because at the end of his gospel, Matthew's going to tell them, now go to the whole world. But it has to start in Jerusalem. It has to start with the children of Israel. It has to start with the people that are already believers. Now take the word out to the ones who don't believe. You know, I, I hear people say all the time, well, we should do all our evangelism efforts. We shouldn't be working on people who have, have a belief in Christ already. We need to be working to the unchurched all over the world, the unchurched, the unchurched. That's not what Jesus told them. He said, go to the ones that already believe, but they not fully understand they don't fully know. Start with them because their hearts are more open. And then go to the unchurched. Then go to the unchurched when you get a chance. But he didn't say leave them out except on this particular time when they were getting ready to go. And he, so he sends them out. He gives them instructions. And, and first he talked about their physical needs. And he says, you know what? My slide's not working. Uh, well, I guess it quit. Uh, he says, don't take any money, extra money. Don't take any extra clothes. Uh, don't take any of the things we would normally take on a mission trip. If you're going on a mission trip, when we get ready to go, do you, do you make a list of things you want to make sure you remember to take? I remember taking my youth group in, in, in Rolla. I had a youth group that, that went on several mission trips with me. And, and when I would take them out, we would always, first day, when we get to wherever we're going, we're going to eat supper, and then we're going to stop at Walmart for all the things they forgot, because there's always something they forgot. And sometimes that was to play. And they'd get in there and play and tear the place up. But that's okay. That's what they were doing. Why not take anything extra with them? Well, one, they weren't going to be gone very long. 
And two, they, they had a specific mission to do, and they're going to come, come back before long. And uh, three, they're going to be among a group of people who were known for their hospitality. That was part of what they were doing. They were going only to the other Israelites, so they weren't to be encumbered. They were to trust in God's providence. And then he tells them this thing about not just uh, don't change residences. Don't change residences. That sounds odd to us. When you come into a town, wherever you find a place to stay, stay there and don't move around. Maybe it has to do with, with Jewish tradition. In Jewish tradition, if you had a rabbi who had come in from somewhere else, you would throw a big celebration. There would be a big party. There would be days of preparation for it and days of party for this person. And if, if I'm busy being prepared for and being a part of the preparations of this great party, how am I going to do the evangelism work of God? And number two, maybe this is just as pertinent. Well, if we go from one house to another, when we get in a better house, we might rather stay there, and we might hurt somebody's feelings. So he says, wherever you go, if somebody takes you in, stay there. Don't look for better accommodations. Oh, wait, you know, I, I appreciate staying at George and Gail's house, but their guest room is, is not anything like this thing right here. I'd rather stay at that house. Wouldn't you? Looks like a nice place to stay. I don't know. I found that online. It's probably a hotel room somewhere that costs $12 a night or more. Uh, but then he also gave them instructions. What to do if people won't receive your message? You know, sometimes folks just don't want to hear it. You can tell somebody until you're blue in the face, Jesus said, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. Everybody else is going to be lost. You can repeat that and repeat that and quote that and quote that and quote that. And if they don't want to hear it, they're not going to hear it. They're going to say, well, he didn't say whoever's not baptized is lost. No, he said whoever is, sa is baptized and believes, believes and is baptized will be saved. We ought to be smart enough to figure the rest of it out, amen? Ought to be a pretty easy math problem for us to work out for ourselves. So then he warns them. He said, hey, it's not just going to be these people that won't receive your message. It's not just going to be people that are going to look ugly and you're going to recognize them. He said, no. He says in Matthew verse 17, he says, Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues. You know who they've got to be afraid of? Their own religious leaders. The men of God, the people of God that are supposed to be leading the people of God are against those who are bringing the message of God to them. He said you need to be aware of the, of the magistrates, of the Roman government, because they're not going to want this new sect to rise to any kind of prominence whatsoever, and they're going to try to persecute you as well chapter 10 verses 18 through 20 and then in verse 21 and later on he says he says brother will deliver brother over to death and, and he says the enemies of you will be those of your own household you know it's not just that the Jewish leaders are going to reject you it's not just that the Roman government's going to want to stop you it's that your own family members won't want to have anything to do with the message that you have they won't like that at all And then he encouraged them. He encouraged them. He offered them his comfort so that as they went out, they would be ready to do the job. On the way back, they stopped and had a group picture made. They were all excited about the work they had done, and they told Jesus, you'd be surprised. I mean, we were able to heal people, and demons came out, and, 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 and it is like, wow, we were something special. And Jesus said, yeah, that's what I told you. Some wouldn't receive you, but you would have power when you went out there. So very quickly, what can we learn from this text of the apostles, of Jesus and his twelve? Number one, we learn we must always pray before an important decision. Jesus prayed all night long. If Jesus needed to pray as much as Jesus needed to pray and as often as Jesus needed to pray, don't you think we ought to pray some? I would think so. I would think we ought to be praying quite a bit. 
We need to pray congregationally. We need to pray individually. We just need to pray. Uh, we need to make the necessary preparations for life pursuits. You know, the apostles spent time with Jesus before they went out. That prepared them for what they needed to do. Preparation is necessary. You want to be a leader? You need to prepare. You want to be a soul winner? You need to prepare. You want to be a spouse? You need to prepare. You want to be a parent? You need to prepare. You want to be involved in any part of life and be successful at life? You need to prepare for it. And the best preparation for a Christian life is spending time with Jesus. Not just in prayer, but in reading his word. In finding out his will for our lives, we ought to do that. And along the way, we learn to trust God for every single need we have. And to realize God will always provide. You know, he told them before they left, he said, everything you need will be provided for you. You don't have to take an extra coat. You don't have to take extra money. You don't have to worry about taking a tent. You don't have to worry about anything. Everything's going to be provided for you along the way. God's going to take care of you. He's always taking care of his own. The shoes of the Israelites never wore out. Forty years wandering in the wilderness and their shoes didn't wear out. I can wear out a pair of shoes in, in a few months easily. But theirs didn't wear out in 40 years. Manna and quail were provided. Oh, it wasn't what they were expecting. Manna simply means what is it? It wasn't what they were expecting, but it was filling, and it was sufficient, and it provided everything they needed, and he'll do the same for us today. This morning, maybe you're a child of God, and you're living in the assurance that God takes care of all your needs. Maybe this morning you're a child of God, and you're going through life walking with Jesus, and you're prepared for whatever may happen in your life. Maybe this morning your faith's not that strong. Maybe this morning it's time to renew your strength and to renew your faith and to follow again the Lord who came, who sent his